Stop worrying about the Fujian's conventional engines. Seriously. The lack of nuclear power is not why this carrier is doomed. The real weak point is a specific piece of technology China installed to beat the Americans that actually ended up crippling their own air wing. It's a flaw so critical that it cuts the ship's combat speed in half compared to a US Nimitz class. And the worst part? It's built into the steel. They can't fix it. This is the story of how China's most advanced aircraft carrier became a prisoner of its own ambition. November 5, 2025, Sanya Naval Base, Hainan Island. President Xi Jinping stands on a dock, presiding over the commissioning ceremony of China's third aircraft carrier, the Fujian. 80,000 tons, over 1,000 feet long, three electromagnetic catapults, the first non-American carrier in the world to launch fifth-generation stealth fighters using the same technology as the USS Gerald R. Ford. Western analysts called it a stunning leap. Chinese state media declared it proof that China had closed the carrier gap with the United States. But there's something they're not telling you, something hidden in the geometry of the flight deck itself. A design compromise made years ago that turned this technological marvel into a strategic liability. Today, we're going to show you exactly what breaks the Fujian and why it might already be too late to save it. To understand what went wrong, you need to understand what China was trying to achieve. For decades, China operated carriers the old-fashioned way. The Liaoning, the Shandong, both used ski jump ramps at the bow, a Soviet-era design that launches planes like a ski jumper off a mountain. It works, but it has one fatal limitation. You have to choose fuel or weapons. Launch with a full weapons load and your combat radius is pathetically short. Launch with full fuel and you can't carry enough missiles to fight. The Americans solved this problem 50 years ago with steam catapults. Then they solved it again with EMALS, the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System. EMALS is a railgun for airplanes. It uses electromagnetic force to accelerate a fighter jet from 0 to 170 miles per hour in less than 3 seconds. No steam, no hydraulics just pure electrical power. And it's a game changer. It means full fuel and full weapons. Every launch, every mission. It means you can launch the KJ-600, a 30-ton airborne early warning aircraft that acts as the carrier's eyes, detecting threats hundreds of miles away. Without EMALS, that plane is too heavy to fly off the deck. With EMALS, you have the nervous system of modern naval warfare. China knew this, and in the mid-2000s, President Xi Jinping made a personal decision that would define the fate of the Fujian. He ordered the design team to skip steam catapults entirely. Go straight to EMALS. Leapfrog the Americans. It was a bold move, an ambitious move, and it was a mistake. Here's where the story gets technical. But stay with me, because this is where it breaks. When China's engineers started designing the Fujian, they planned to use steam catapults. Steam catapults are about 70 meters long, the hull was designed with that in mind. Then she gave the order, switch to E-M-A-L-S. But E-M-A-L-S catapults are longer, much longer. And the hull width? Already locked in. They couldn't widen the ship without starting over from scratch, so they made a compromise. They installed three E-M-A-L-S catapults running forward toward the bow, cramming them into a space that was never designed for them. And that's when the geometry became a nightmare. On a modern supercarrier, you need three zones on the flight deck. One, the launch zone, where catapults fire planes into the sky. Two, the recovery zone, the angled landing strip where planes trap arresting cables. Three, the parking area, where planes wait their turn. On American carriers, both Nimitz and Ford class, these zones are separated. The angled deck is offset far enough to the left that it doesn't interfere with the catapults. Launch and recovery happen at the same time, planes taking off, planes landing, constant motion, constant combat power. But on the Fujian, the zones overlap. Catapult 2, on the port side of the bow, sits directly in the approach path of the angled landing deck. When a plane is coming in to land, Catapult 2 cannot launch. It's physically unsafe. And Catapult 3? Even worse! It's positioned in the middle of the waist, the area where planes go if they miss the arresting cables and have to abort the landing. That means when a plane is trying to land, Catapult 3 is in the danger zone. You cannot launch from it, period. Only Catapult 1, on the starboard bow, can operate during recoveries. And even that's risky. So here's what happens in real combat. A wave of Chinese fighters returns from a mission, low on fuel. 
the air boss, the flight deck commander, has to make a choice, stop launching or let them crash. He stops launching. Catapults 2 and 3 go silent. The deck crew retracts the shuttle. The planes waiting to take off just wait for 45 minutes, maybe an hour, until the landing cycle is complete. Then, and only then, can they reset the deck and launch the next wave. This isn't just an inconvenience, this is a disaster. In naval warfare, there's one metric that defines a carrier's combat power, sortie generation rate, SGR. It's how many combat missions a carrier can fly in 24 hours, not how many planes it has, how many missions it can actually generate, launch, fight, recover, rearm, launch again. The faster you can cycle through that process, the more combat power you have. A US Nimitz-class carrier, using steam catapults and an optimized flight deck, can generate about 120 sorties per day. The USS Gerald R. Ford, with emails and simultaneous launch and recovery operations, can hit 160 sorties per day. In surge mode, going all out, it can push 240. The Fujin, 60 to 80 sorties per day, maybe 90 if they push it, that's half, half the combat power of a Ford-class carrier, and here's why that's catastrophic. In a real conflict, say, over Taiwan, the Fujian wouldn't just be outnumbered, it would be outcycled. American carriers could maintain two continuous combat air patrols, provide close air support to Marines on the ground, and still launch strike packages against Chinese shore installations. All at the same time, the Fujian would have to choose, launch attacks or defend the fleet, provide air cover or strike the enemy, it can't do both. And in modern naval combat, that hesitation is death. Because while the Fujian's deck is idle, waiting for a recovery cycle to finish, American F-35s are stacking missions. More bombs on target, more air superiority, more pressure. The Fujian's air wing would be ground down, sortie by sortie, until it couldn't sustain operations anymore. And the ship, this 80,000-ton marvel of engineering, would become a floating target. Now here's the part that makes this truly tragic. China knows. They know the Fujian is flawed. Naval analysts in Beijing understood the consequences of the overlapping deck zones before the ship even launched. So why did they build it anyway? Because the Fujian was never meant to win a war today. It's a university, a floating training platform designed to teach the Chinese Navy how to operate a modern supercarrier. Think about it. Operating a carrier with EMALS requires thousands of highly trained personnel, flight deck crews who can choreograph plane movements at high speed, engineers who can troubleshoot electromagnetic catapults in the middle of the ocean, pilots who can transition from ski jump launches to catapult-assisted takeoffs, command staff who can coordinate multi-mission operations in a contested battle space. China didn't have any of that 10 years ago. The Fujian gives them a place to learn, to make mistakes, to break things, to figure out what works. Every failure on the Fujian generates data. How often does emails break? Where does it fail? What spares do we need? How long does it take to repair at sea? All of that knowledge flows directly into China's next carrier, the Type 004. Nuclear-powered, designed from the keel up with the correct hull width. A flight deck where the launch and recovery zones don't overlap. A ship that can match or even exceed the combat power of the USS Gerald R. Ford. China plans to build six of them by 2035. The Fujian isn't the endgame. It's the tuition payment for the education China needs to challenge American naval dominance in the Pacific. And that's the terrifying part, because it means China is playing the long game. So here's the brutal truth. The Fujian is broken by design, not by sabotage, not by incompetence, by a deliberate compromise made when President Xi ordered the switch to EMALS mid-design. The catapults are too long for the hull. The deck is too narrow for simultaneous operations. The sortie generation rate is half what it should be. And there is no fix. You can't widen the flight deck without cutting the ship in half and rebuilding it. You can't move the catapults. They're welded into the structure. You can't redesign the angled landing deck. There's no room. The Fujian will operate at 50% combat power for its entire service life. But here's what should keep American admirals awake at night. China accepted this. They built a flawed carrier, commissioned it with full fanfare, and put it to sea knowing it would never match a Nimitz class in sustained combat. Because they're not trying to win in 2025, they're training for 2035. When the Type 004 supercarriers enter service, when China has a nine-carrier fleet, when the sailors who learned their trade on the Fujian are commanding the ships designed to defeat us, the Fujian is a warning.
not of Chinese weakness, but of Chinese patience. They're willing to spend a decade operating a compromised carrier because they understand something we sometimes forget. Naval power isn't built in a year. It's built in generations. The technology that breaks the Fujian isn't the engine. It's the flight deck geometry, a flaw locked into the steel from the day the keel was laid. But the lesson China is learning from that flaw, that might be the technology that breaks us. Because America's strength has never been in underestimating our rivals. It's been in taking them seriously. Even when they're still learning, especially when they're still learning. Want to know how the US Navy is responding to China's carrier buildup? Watch our deep dive on distributed maritime operations next.